That was awesome, folks. I tell you, come on. How about Katie and Robin in the opening song? That was incredible. Now, these are so blessed, folks. We are so blessed. So blessed with a team of people who lead us and recognize what it is to worship the creator of the universe, to understand a love that is just so amazing, so incredible, that we are to express our love to him. That's worship. To, it is love that is expressed that we would just cry out to God who is incredible and amazing to our Savior, Redeemer, and Lord Christ Jesus. Awesome. Awesome. I'm, I'm telling you, I'm thinking, Lord, you can come right now and that would be awesome. I'm ready to go. Huge, huge, huge. What a, what a great presence this morning. Man, folks, welcome to Believer's Chapel. If you are new here this morning, we certainly welcome you. We love you. We are so excited that you choose to spend time with us. We're simple, folks. We're a worshiping word church. We believe that God, the Creator, Christ, the Son of God who put Himself on a cross, how can we not express our praise and our thanks and come to Him with, with just such a needy bunch as I am? Nothing without you. I'm so desperate for you. We come to His presence to worship and to acknowledge and to adore. And then we're a word church, man. We look at this and say, yep. Okay. Understood. Yep. Genesis to Revelation. Yep. We believe that this is the absolute truth. And we live our lives according to this. As his children, as one who has paid the price for you and I, we look at his word and say, I'm in. Folks, that's incredible. Welcome to Believer's Chapel this morning. Thank you so much. Last night, we have three services, folks, 6 o'clock on Saturday night. That, there's just an incredible atmosphere as well on our Saturday nights. It is just, the day's over, we're relaxed. It's just people are just ready to just come in for one purpose, is to worship and to hear the word, and they come hungry. And then our first service on Sunday is 9 o'clock, and then our packed house at 11. Um, Houghton students, welcome home. Glad that you are back. Uh, Pit of Bread, welcome home. Glad that you are back. Bonaventure, JCC. Uh, pumped to have our college crew here. Very excited. Uh, Going to have a, just an in incredible meal for you next week. Uh, so please, please be here. Invite a friend. We're going to touch on that in a minute. But uh, folks, let's just pray. Ask God to speak to us this morning. Father, we just come before you. God, it's useless to come in this place just to play church, God. Useless. We come in here to have an encounter with you. We come in here that we understand that we are going to hear from the living God. That we open your word which is alive and powerful. God, this service right here, every time we come into a service, it has the ability to rearrange our lives, God. It has the power to rearrange who we are from the inside out. Father, every time your word is that powerful, it is that alive. We come before your word hungry to hear from you. God, that you would speak to us this morning. Father, every eye in this place would be open to see exactly what we need to see. God, every mindset in this place would be clear of any distraction, to be totally understood, to have a clear mind, to understand exactly what we need to understand today in this message. God, I pray for every heart in this place. God, that we are hungry. Our hearts are like a sponge. That, God, we come before you hungry to feed. God, we are hungry. We want to hear from you today. Feed us this morning. I ask that you would just ask God in your heart of hearts, ask Him, Father, speak to me. Father, I'm hungry. God, I'm ready to hear from you this morning. Father, I need to hear from you this morning. God, you know my today. God, you know where I'm at right now. God, I'm desperate to hear from you today. Folks, you cry out to the Father like that and you will hear from God. Amen. Come on, two places this morning. I want you to turn to two places, Genesis 2 and Ephesians 5. Turn to Ephesians 5, put a marker in Ephesians 5. We'll be there in a second. Ephesians 5, and then turn over to Genesis 2. We'll start right in the beginning, right in Genesis. We are starting a new series today. It might go four, six weeks, not sure. We'll see how far we get. But folks, this is one of those things we do once a year. And we talk about marriage and we talk about families and we talk about being single and we talk about preparing for marriage and what it is to do it right God style. That means God's way. When we recognize how we do marriage and how we do life and how we prepare, we do it God's way, then and only then we get God's results. 
when we do it his way. He is the creator of husband and wife. He is the creator of marriage. The Bible says this in Hebrews 13, 4. It says marriage is to be held in honor among all. That is marriage. One man, one woman. God created marriage. It is to be held in honor among all. That word honor, okay, that means something that is uh, priceless, something that is so valuable that you can't tag a price on it. That's what God says about marriage. That it is in such a place of honor in his eyes and how he created it that it is priceless. You can't value it. You can't put a price on it. That's what God says about marriage. Priceless. Huge, folks. And we look at this. We look at where we're going in the next four to six weeks and we recognize, yes, marriage, that hits you. If you are single, yes, that hits you. If you are married, it has hit you or have hit you. This is the deal. And please understand this. This is one of those series that is, is going to hit home. This is one of those series, if you come hungry, gang, this is my expectation at the end of the series, that marriages in this place are never the same. They are in such a direction saying, God, I got it. God, it's about you. God, it's about my wife. God, it's about my husband. God, I understand what I need to do to prepare for that amazing day that I'm going to be married. Over, Listen, over 90%, they, they say 92% of people will be married. This hits almost everybody. I don't know about the 2%, that's a small person, but I'm talking about, you know, over 9 out of 10 people are going to go to the altar and get married. Folks, I guarantee you that 9 out of 10 people who, get, who, who go to that altar, every single person who gets married wants to have a good marriage. Nobody goes to the altar going, man, I'm going to get married and this is going to be the worst decision of my life. I can't wait for my life to be just horrendous and horrible and go through divorce and go through the wreckage and go through the pain. I am so excited about that. Listen, everybody goes to the altar going, this is going to be great. I want a happy marriage and I want to be full of joy and I want to walk. That's why people get married. Everybody wants a good marriage. So please, in this series, you come and you come expectant and you come ready and you come hungry and you bring somebody. And you bring somebody. This is one of those series that changes your world. And you might say, well, Sean, i got a great marriage. I'm married to an amazing man. I'm married to a, an amazing woman. We love Jesus and we're serving Jesus. And we really do care for one another. We love one another. We're doing God's. That's fantastic. You know what my job is to do as a pastor is to equip you to do the work of the ministry where you take this and you go out to friends and family who are hurting and you begin to speak truth into their marriage. That's what it's for. And if you're in this place and you have a broken marriage, and if you would get serious about your marriage and you would recognize that God's whole plan is for that marriage to be restored. And if you're serious about that, you walk out of this series different with hope to recognize how to fight, to recognize who you're battling against, to recognize what, what it takes to have a godly marriage. You walk out of this thing different. Gang, that's huge. That is huge. I sit down with couple after couple after couple about marriage. And probably in the first meeting, I tell them, unless you're serious, it's not going to work and you're wasting a lot of time. Meaning serious, like how much time have you prayed? How much time have you fasted for your marriage? How much time have you been on your face before God crying out for your wife or for your husband? How many hours, I mean hours, hours have you spent on your face before the king? Day after day after day that this marriage would be restored. Or is this this whimsical little thing where we're going to come and get some advice and it's just not going to work anyways? Listen, gang, this is the deal. We are in a serious battle for marriage today. We're in a serious war for marriage. And if there is problems and there is this brokenness in marriage, then we've got to recognize that it is a serious battle to restore this thing back to a place that glorifies and honors God. Back to a place that it is better than the day you got married. Gang, that is God's plan. But it takes work, folks. It takes a man and a woman who are broken to get on their face before God day after day and begin to pray and ask God to forgive them and begin to pray and, and ask God, how do I bless my wife? How do I bless my husband? How do I change? How do I get into this thing? And it's fasting and it's praying and then God will show up, gang, and do an amazing work, an amazing work in your relationship. Please understand this. Next to your decision for Jesus Christ, your marriage, your deci decision to get married is the greatest decision that you will ever make. So how about we make it right? How about we make it something that is amazing, that you can't wait to get home, you can't wait to spend time with your wife, you can't wait for your husband. 20 years in, it's the best day of your life. 
30 years in, she's the most amazing woman on this planet. 35 years in, he is the most incredible man. That's, that is God's plan. And that takes work, folks. But it is so possible because today we're going to break this thing down. And we're going to look at marriage through God's eyes and how created it. Come on, Genesis 2. Hallelujah. Right at the beginning, folks, you've got to recognize right off the bat that point number one of this message is this, that we're up against an enemy who hates you. He hates your kids. He hates your husband. He hates your wife. He hates God. He hates Christ. And he hates marriage. When you understand that the very first thing, when you get married, you're hated. When you step in that place of marriage, listen, Satan hates unity. He hates the union of male and female. He hates husband and wife. He hates that picture of marriage. Listen, the first part of this message, you're going to see very clearly that we are up against the fight against the enemy when it comes to marriage. Because in Ephesians 5, it talks about Christ and the church, and that picture that God has painted between Christ and the church is mirrored in the image of husband and wife. And Satan hates Christ in the church. And if God has painted this amazing picture of what Christ is to the church, and he's painted it through husband and wife in marriage, Satan will destroy that all that he can. And please, please don't misunderstand. It didn't start this generation. That didn't start two generations. That didn't start 2,000 years ago. That started with the very first marriage, folks. Satan has hated marriage from Adam and Eve. That started... In the garden, we're at war, folks. And the war has continued from the very first union. Let's look at this thing. Genesis 2.24 says this. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall be, or the, and then they shall become one flesh. Look at this. He will leave his mother and father and be joined. That word joined, it means to cleave. It is like you take a piece of paper, piece of paper, glue it, stick it together, come back the next day, cleave. That's what that's talking about. You try to rip those apart, that paper, both sheets of paper are destroyed. Look what he says. And they shall become one flesh. You highlight that. You, you underline that. That word, one, it's talking about unity. It's talking about there is no longer two. Mark says there's no longer two, but there's one. It isn't a mine and hers, but it's an ours. It isn't a this and that. It's us. This is what it is. It's about us. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's about us. We are now a single unit. We are now a single fighting force. We have become one. That's unity. Look at the next verse, 25. And the man and his wife were both naked and not ashamed. We are unified and we are not ashamed. We are unified and there is no shame between us. We have nothing to hide. Could you imagine walking in a marriage where you are completely, totally unified as one fighting force? And there is nothing to hide between you. They were naked and unashamed. Folks, naked, that means naked. Don't try to over-spiritualize that. Well, that just means, no, it means nude. Look it up. That's, it means naked. That's what that word means. They had nothing to be ashamed of. They had nothing to fear about his opinion or her opinion. They had nothing, nothing to be embarrassed about or shameful over, period. When that, one of those two ingredients right there in a marriage, just make your marriage amazing to walk in such unity and to walk in such a place where you never have to hide and there is no shame. That's God's plan from the beginning. But look at this. The enemy shows up. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, God has said, You shall not eat from any tree of the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, Folks, I've got to tell you, the serpent hasn't changed. He says he's more crafty from any beast of the field. He, he is the greatest, most powerful deceiver, liar that has ever and will ever walk the planet. Gang, this is the deal. We are fighting against the enemy, an, an enemy that is the best in the business at deception. The best in the business at lying. That's why the Bible says that we are to be sober and we are to be alert. We are to be on watch for the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. 
1 Peter 5, 8. We understand when you first recognize that we are fighting against a very real enemy who hates marriage. And he is the best in the business at deception. He is the best in the business at lying. He is the best at the business at ripping people apart. And it started in the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, from the fruit of the trees in the garden we may eat, but from the fruit that is on the tree in the middle of the garden, God has said you shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. And the serpent said to the woman, You will surely not die, for God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate, and she gave also to her husband with her, and he ate. God gave the instruction to the man. He gave it to Adam. said, do not touch, do not eat this fruit. Adam passed that along to Eve. said, listen, God has given me instruction that we are not to touch this tree. We are not to eat of this tree's fruit. Well, Eve goes, gets deceived by the, by the serpent, and Adam is standing right there, folks, letting this whole thing unfold. Who's accounted for the sin issue? The man. Now look at this. I want you to see this. They sin. They both take. They both eat. Then, verse 7, the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. They heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife, look at this, hid themselves. I like that. From the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Verse 9 says this, and the, Lord God, and the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? Folks, this is the first game of hide and seek in all eternity. They're playing hide and seek with the Lord God who knows everything and is everywhere. How many times do we try to play hide and seek with God? They sinned and they tried to hide. Isn't it true that when we sin, we try to play hide and seek? Like, oh, God didn't see that. I mean, you think God didn't know right where they were? Why would they have to hide themselves from God? Because shame showed up, folks. Look at this. Then he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. What do you do when you're full of shame, folks? You hide. Look at the two things that the enemy broke up. Number one, he brought shame when there was to be no shame. Verse 12, the man, look at this. The man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me from the tree and I ate. And the Lord said to the woman, what is this that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. They go, they now play this game that we so often play in marriage. It's called the, the shame and blame game. They were once walking in absolute perfect unity. And now they're playing a blame game. Well, that woman you gave me, she caused me to eat. Really, what's that story? That serpent that you created, you're the one who created, he's the one that caused me to eat. Isn't it so true, folks, when we are walking in this place and then something goes wrong and the, one of the very first things we do is begin to blame each other. And we go, well, you did this or you did that or you did this or you did And then we start playing, well, guess where that came from? The first marriage. The very first thing the enemy attacked was their unity and them being unashamed. And he brought disunity and division and they started playing the blame game and the shame game and it hasn't stopped since. This is not something that we're dealing with in this generation. This is something that has been going on for, since the very first marriage, folks. We've got to see this because we have to recognize that we're in a fight against a very real enemy, enemy for your marriage, for your husband and for your wife and for your kids and for your teens and it is a serious fight. It is a serious fight. Ephesians 5. I want you to see this. We're not going to get into the role of the husband and the wife today. Uh, not even close. That will be uh, a couple weeks. But I want you to see this fight that we're in. I want you to see why the enemy so passionately hates the marriage union between a man and a woman. Why he so passionately comes against the marriage union between husband and wife. Every time you see Christ in the church, mark it, man. Look at this. Verse 22. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church. Highlight that. As Christ is also the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. But as much 
Look at this. But as the church is subject to Christ, highlight that. As church is subject to Christ, so also wives ought to be to their husbands and everything. Husbands, love your wives. Highlight this. Just as Christ also loved the church. This is about Christ and the church interweaving with husband and wife. Now look at this. So that he might sanctify her, cleanse her by the washing of the water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his, his own wife loves himself. Verse 29. For, he, for no one ever hated his flesh, but nourished it. How? Just as Christ also does the church, because we are members of his body. For this reason, man shall leave his mother and father, and they shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Verse 32, the mystery is great, but I'm speaking with reference to Christ and the church. He's, listen, this is amazing. He is setting up an incredible picture of marriage to be like that of Christ and the church. Why does Satan so hate marriage? Why did he hate it from the very beginning? Because it is an incredible picture that God has been painting that represents a picture of what we can have with Christ as the church. This union be, be, as Christ has with the church and the church has with Christ is this picture that God has set up to imitate that and he called it marriage. That's why God said marriage is to be held in honor, a place of without value. Man, you can't put a price tag on this and it's to be held in honor among all. Because I am painting a picture of that which I have done with Christ and the church. And you can see it in the picture of husband and wife. Gang, that's incredible. That's incredible when you see your responsibility, a husband and a wife, to rec recognize that when people look at our marriage, they should see a picture of what they can have with Christ because we're the church. That's incredible. That's amazing. And I think today's day, we started this church four years ago. And I think today's day, one of, the brightest, one of the brightest lights we can be as believers is have this marriage that is so full of union, is so full of without shame, is so full of walking in the way that God has created marriage to be, and that it is a light to the because everybody wants a good marriage. And the only way you really have one that is a great marriage designed by God is you do it God's way. And as they look at you, isn't it amazing that you can lead people to the cross and lead people to Jesus based on the picture of your marriage? How powerful is that? That's amazing. And when you see how serious it is to have a marriage that is honored and blessed and following God, it is a picture that we can set for people that they can have with Christ. That's incredible. And the enemy hates it. That's why he comes against marriage. You wonder why we have so many problems in marriage. I really believe this, folks. Because the enemy has got husband and wife to fight against each other and not fight against him. When they understand, when they really get the real picture of who's trying to crush that marriage. And they get the picture that it is the enemy that has come against their marriage. Could you imagine what it would take if they turned their efforts together and became one and began to be that one voice, that one voice, that one force that would forcefully push the enemy. The Bible says to submit to God, resist him. Isn't it amazing that a husband and wife who are broken can come together as one force and resist the devil together as one. And then the Bible says he must flee. It is incredible what takes place when unity comes back to a place where you have the ability to fight together as one, to resist the enemy, and then he flees. But he wants husband and wife to be against one another and, and then begin to think the battle's against us and the battle's against him. When you first see where the battle lies, folks, then you can fight right. And please know this. I know, listen, I'm, I know that we have people who uh, have loved Jesus. Very aware of the divorce rate. Very aware of what they put all these... Stats out there to just let everyone know how horrible marriage is. I hate stats like that because it's just, oh, don't get married. It's a failure. Look at the stats. Mm, I'm telling you, that, don't do that. I hate that. Oh, don't get, and listen, you get, you, I'm, getting, I'm getting engaged. Oh, let the flood come because you're going to hear all the nasty, all the stupid, all the stupid people out there going, oh, don't get married because this is the worst thing in the world. Oh, don't you know the divorce rate? Don't you know? Mm, mm, mm. Don't you know what God said about marriage? Let's flip that. I mean, seriously, we look at this. God's design plan for marriage. 
And I'm very aware that there are people, even in this church over and over and over, so many, who have gone through the disaster and the hurt and the brokenness and the pain of a divorce. And I tell you what, please know this for this series. I'm speaking only to one marriage. The one that you're in now. That's the only one I'm going to deal with. Because right now, honestly, that's the only one that matters. Is the one that you're in. We've got to let the past go. And we've got to move on to a place to say, my pastor is for my marriage today. My pastor wants my marriage today to be blessed and honored. To walk in a place of being forgiven in your marriage. The only one I'm going to preach to is the one you're in. That's it. When we recognize that, folks, we can go so far in our marriage and watch God come and do a work. Incredible. Incredible. Come on, point number two is this. I want you to see this. If you want God's results, there's only one way to get God's results in marriage, and it's doing it God's way. How many times do we try to get in life and do things? Well, God says this, but I'm going to rearrange it a little bit. God said to do it this way, but I'm going, to, I'm going to really try to maybe add my own version of that. God said to do it this way, but I'm going to try it this way. And then we don't get God's results, and we blame God. Isn't that amazing? It is amazing to me that we do it our way, and we're begging God to fix our issues when we've disobeyed God. That's not the way. God, does, God doesn't fix our disobedience, folks. He fixes our repentance. He fixes when we come before him broken. We come before him repentant, recognizing your word said this, but I did it this way. And how dare we blame God for us doing it our own way and then it not working. The only way we get God's results, the only way, if we do it God's way, folks. Please, young people in this church, teenagers, young adults, college students, this is huge. Next week, we're going to hit this thing hard in what it takes to be prepared for marriage as one who is single and waiting. One who is single, hungry to be married. One who is single and saying, God, you be the matchmaker. Next week, this is huge. We are fe- I didn't even work out this way on purpose. We are feeding the college students next week. Bring, I'm telling you, cover your campus this week. Cover your campuses. High school students, fill this place next week. Parents, make sure your teenagers are here. Do not miss this next week, and we're going to dig into this thing, and you will be so, so glad that you came to hear this. Parents, you'll be so glad that your kids came to hear this because we are going to hit it. We're going to hit it hard in regards to disobeying God and even thinking or daring to get involved with somebody who isn't totally surrendered in love with Jesus. If you get involved with somebody who is not saved, who doesn't come to this place to love Jesus, to understand that he is Lord, to surrender their life to him, then please, please do not... Do not be angry with God when your life falls apart. Because God said, don't do it. God said, don't mix and match. Don't do it. Don't get involved with those who are not his. This is huge today. But we get impatient. We so desperately want to get married. And we take anything that comes along that is nice. I don't give a rip how nice he is. I don't give a rip how nice she is. If she is not or he is not sold out and surrendered to Christ, it will flop and it will be disastrous and you will regret it. Please, that's next week. Oh, smoke, come on. You got to be here next week. Students, fill this place. I'm telling you, come on. Oh, come on, number two. God's results require God's way. Look at this list, folks. Here's a list. These are one words taken from these scriptures that define what God says about marriage, that define what marriage can be when done. I don't know a person on this planet that wouldn't want a marriage like this, that wouldn't beg for a marriage like this. And it's possible when you do it God's way. <clears throat> Look at these words. Unified, naked and unashamed, blessed, rejoice, satisfied, exhilarating, crown means victory or celebration, a good thing, favor, from the Lord. Look at Proverbs 19.14 said that, that a, a, a wife who is prudent is a gift from God. Dan, you know what prudent means? It means one who has good judgment. One who has discernment. One who has discretion. You know, listen, we're going to get into this in, in a couple of weeks. When we really talk about what it is to be the head of the house. What it really biblically means to be the spiritual accountable leader to that home. That does not mean that you're the Archie Bunker of today. That does not mean, honey, get me water, get me this, get me that, do this. I say we're going this direction, shush, because I'm the head. You you pull the head card. That's not what that means, folks. When you recognize what the Bible says about Eve, that that Adam 
who knows? Maybe, I don't know what was that I'm doing, but God says, you need help. Eve shows up, right? Puts him to a sleep, rib falls out, puts it in Eve, creates this amazing woman. I'm sure Adam was not displeased with what he saw when his eyes opened. Like, hey, whoa, yes. Listen, this is the deal. Why? Because he needed help. That's what the Bible says, help mate. When we recognize that our wives are a gift from God and they are prudent and they are discerning and they, are, and they have this, this wisdom about them that they can see things before you see them. Gang, listen, if I, if I pulled the head card with my wife many years ago, I'd be in Atlanta. <laughs> I'm telling you the truth. That, that we, we were called to go to Atlanta. We thought, I thought it would be me. I thought it'd be great. I get to help start a church. It was amazing. I, I flew to Atlanta several times. I got a police job down there. I had two departments looking at me. Listen, they had black and white police cars. That's a cop car. I mean, if you're a cop, you want to be in a cool cop car, right? And these were black and whites, man. These things were real cops, real. I mean, they were busy. There was a lot of bad guys. I'm like, this is a fit. This is awesome. And I'm like, Renee, this is God. Come on. And she's like, Sean, it's not. Sean, God called us here for a reason. I'm like, if I pulled the head guard, folks, but I have a wife who's prudent. And I got a wife who has better judgment at times than I do. And I have a wife who is discerning. She says, Sean, that road leads to disaster. And I did not pull the unbiblical head guard. Or we would be in a disaster place. We might be in a cool cop car. <laughs> But I wouldn't be here. When you understand, and you begin to break down real deal Bible, what God has set up for marriage, folks, you understand your woman, your wife, is a gift from God. An excellent wife. Let's look at the next one. Valuable. Trustworthy. Lacking nothing. Good every day. Who would want that? Good every day. She does him good and not evil every day. That's what that says. Wouldn't that be amazing? To be in a marriage that every day is good, full of praise, passion, desire, friendship. Wouldn't it be amazing to be in a relationship that you really, truly are friends, that there is this bond of friendship between a man and a wife, that there is this friend. You can't wait to get home. You can't wait. The, the, the person that you most in all of your life want to spend time with is your wife or your husband because you recognize that there's my friend. That's what lies between friendship. Listen, Song of Solomon, the bride said it very clearly. This is my beloved and this is my friend. This is my lover whom I'm passionately desiring. Read Song of Solomon, powerful. And this is my friend. It is amazing the relationship that God sets up between a husband and a wife to have that unity and to have that friendship. When we grow old together, 30 years in, 40 years in, 50 years in, and that bond of friendship gets stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger. That's friendship. That's the way God created marriage to be. Isn't that amazing? Unified. Never to be separated. Stay sexually active and be fulfilled. 1 Corinthians 7, 5. Love unconditionally, undeniably, undefeatably. That's a Christ-like love. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Undeniably, can never be defeated. That's how Christ loved you and I. And it is an unconditional love where you cannot put a condition. Aren't you amazed? Aren't you amazed that Christ never put a condition on how he is to love us? He loved us in our worst. And listen, the Bible says that men are to have a love for their wives. That mirrors Christ's love for the church. Sacrifice, purity, nourishing, tender care, respect and honor, harmony. That means to agree together. Wouldn't it be amazing to walk in a marriage relationship that there is true harmony? That we agree together in mind and in heart. That there is such agreement among us that we are in this great place of unity. And folks, this is the deal. Please hear this. When you walk in a disunity, when there isn't harmony, you know what you do? You go back and you pray about it. And you go back separately and say, I'm going to pray about it. And you pray about it. And then we'll come together and we'll pray about it. And when we come to an agreement through prayer, then we're back in unity. Then we're back walking in a harmonious level. Yeah, that's what you do. You go back and you pray and you pray and you pray. And there may be times that you'll have to go to your wife and say, I, you know what? I just don't have the answer. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to trust in you as a prudent wife. Honey, I don't have the answer, but I'm going to trust in you as a godly husband that you're leading right. 
Because I just, I, I don't know what we pray. And then we can come together and agree in heart and mind and walk in harmony. Compassionate and sympathetic. You know what that means? That when I hurt, she hurts. When she hurts, I hurt. When I rejoice, she rejoices. When, when she rejoices, I rejoice. That is in such a place of, of compassionate and having sympathy for one another. Kind and gentle and humble. You want the secret. You want the absolute bottom line of marriage for a powerful, incredible marriage. You put yourself second. You put his needs and his desires above yours. You put her needs and her desires above yours. When you have two people who are selfless and they're walking together, unbreakable. Unbreakable. Powerful. That's what God says about it. That's his words. Please. Well, I, someone made a list. They, they, uh, they copied that whole list. And if you want them, they, I guess they're giving copies out. Those words are what's found in Scripture on marriage and how God created it. Who wouldn't want that, folks? You want God's result in marriage? You've got to do it God's way. You have to do it God's way, folks. You have to. Last one is this. Brennan, you come up. You know whose choice it is, folks? Your choice. You need to choose today. You need to choose today. Today things change. Listen, I have a great marriage, Sean. I, then great. Today's the day that you change and what your responsibility is. That your responsibility is to go out and do ministry. Your responsibility is to go out and, and share the good news. Your responsibility is to be that light and that salt that is so necessary today. To be one who says, listen, you can have a godly marriage. You can be, you can walk in a place of unity in your husband. Then you take this series and you just chew on this thing. And you be the ones who become the ministers to those who are desperate and broken and hurting. Gang, I guarantee you every single one of us in this room knows people who are broken and hurting and it's a basis of a relationship. Well, how powerful it is when you have a man and a wife who come together and they come before him and say, listen, this is the way we've done it. That's why it's so amazing. It's because it's of God. And you can have this not because of us, but because of him. Now please grab the hand of your wife or your husband, please. Joshua 24, 15 says this. Joshua made it very clear, folks. If it is disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves today whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served, which were beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you're living. But as for me and my house, but as for me and my wife, as for me and my children, as for me and my home, we're going to serve the Lord. Choice, folks. And it's your choice today to say, I'm going to start this thing today. I'm going to walk in a place to choose to serve God in my home today. I'm going to make a decision to make it not about me today. I'm going to make a decision as the husband to put her needs and her desires first today. I'm going to make a decision as a wife to put his needs and his desires first today. Today I choose to do it God's way. Today I choose that it's the Lord. Listen, let the world choose what they are going to choose. But as for me and my house, we're doing it God's way. Gang, it's a choice. That's what it comes down to. It's your choice to say, I am putting my stake in the ground to say it's God's way in my home. Period. Folks, we are at war. That's why I am, no. Oh, we are in a serious battle zone for this. And we're at war for this. And you put your stake in the ground. And you say, it is one way. And it's not my way. It's not her way. It's God's way. That's my house. And if you're a young person in this place, you put your stake in the ground and say, I will do it God's way. Period. That's it. I will wait and I will be patient until that God man or that God woman shows up and we will walk in a place of unity. Incredible. And you put your stake in and you make a decision to say, it is God's way today. Period. Oh, folks, come on. Let's pray. God, I just thank you for this morning and I thank you for this word. God, I am so amazed that I get to preach to people who are so hungry for truth. God, I thank you for this team. I thank you for this church. And I thank you that we are here. And I thank you for every husband and every wife and every single. God, that they will open themselves up to this series. And they will commit to this series. And God, I'm begging you to come and do a work in their homes. 
A God that starts today. Things change today. We walk out of this place different today. We walk out fighting not against each other, but fighting against the enemy. We walk out today very aware of the enemy coming against our home, very aware of the enemy trying to take our marriage out, very aware of that, and we combine our efforts to become one, to vigorously oppose him, that he would flee from this house. Hallelujah. God, that we would commit to this. Oh, God, that we would take this list and say, God, that's your plan for marriage. That's what you said that I could have in my house. In my home, God, that we get back to that. And we do it your way. God, we are asking for a healing in the broken marriages that are in this church, that will be in this church. Our friends and our family who have such a brokenness. God, even those who have been through divorce and are so broken and are so hurting, God. God, that you would heal them. That there is life after divorce and there is healing and there is joy and there is peace and there is love after divorce. God, that we'd be so kind and so gentle and so loving and so tender and so understanding. That God, this is a broken, broken group of people. God, our compassion would match your compassion. God, we would break our hearts with that which breaks your... God, these are people who have been devastated and hopeless, God. That we would do everything we can to be compassionate to them and to show them that God has a plan and God has a purpose. God help us. In Jesus' name, amen. Folks, let's stand up, please.